the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. God, we think you're wonderful. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. We need God. You need God. Come on, stand to your feet with us and let's go before the Lord. <clears throat> Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we know that assuredly that we haven't come to hear from a man or a woman. No, no, that's not what this is about. This is about coming to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, and direct us. Motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory and all the honor. It's all yours, not a man's. We're not here to build a man's kingdom. We're here to build the kingdom of God. And Lord, in your kingdom, there's all kinds of churches that are there that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. All across the Inland Empire, all across the world today, Wow, Lord, there are just many of them out there. We want you to bless them, our brothers and sisters, as you would bless us. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, Assemblies of God, Foursquare. Our Adventist brothers and sisters, the Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better, but they're great people. We ask you to bless them also, Lord. But also, Lord, we'd ask you to bless Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity and Ecclesia Church. Lord, we thank you for the diversity that's out there where a person can find the right place to worship the one true God. And we give you the praise and glory that you make a way for every personality, every mindset, every position that you make a way for them. And we honor your wisdom this day by asking you to bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, if you're wondering why Debbie's up here, I am too. <laughs> no, no. She actually, remember last week she started off, and I was watching on the internet last week. Those of you guys that are watching on the internet, and you're a little bleary here, a little bleary there, you have patience with us. We're working on getting it all really clear and clean, and someday you'll tune in, and it'll be just absolutely perfect. But I was watching Deb on the internet last week. Just loved her message, but she only got through a, a few of the points, and, and I want her to come back and finish that message. So here's how it's going to work tonight so that you understand. She's going to start off, and she's going to bring your mind up to speed, and that means she's going to remind you of things that she spoke of last week. Then she's going to go over point number one with you, uh, just a little bit, just so you can rehearse your thinking about what she was saying. And then I'm going to bring you point number two, and then she's going to bring you point number three, and I'm going to close with point number four. So we're going to work this together, and we're going to let the Spirit of God just speak to you uh, today, and it's going to be great. How many of you are ready to hear from the Lord this night? God wants to speak to you. Deborah, take it, girl. Well, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, and I'm going to just quickly review. And I started last week saying that I just giving a little bit of a testimony about my background. And I came from a very intact, wonderful family. My mom and dad are still alive. My dad's 85, my mom's 84. My dad was in World War II and put his pants on every day and went to work and raised us three crazy kids. And my sister's in her 60s and my brother's a year older than I am. And so we, I came from a very blessed family, but I came from a family that was raised up in a wonderful denomination. And I was raised in such a way that actually money and any kind of wealth was frowned upon. There was, it was virtuous to be somewhat poor. And so when I married this crazy man over here, Jim Cobray, he came from wealth and Bel Air and I remember, gosh, I remember going up to Lone Pine where my mom and dad lived and Jim was telling me one of his words and it was Gerb, and I just, he'd never met my parents, and I said, on the way up, we're engaged, and I said, what does the word Gerb mean? Because I'd never heard it before. It was a Jim Cobray word. He says, you know, those are people that park their trucks on their front lawn. And I just sort of slid under the seat as we pulled into my mom and dad's house, and there's all the trucks on the front lawn. <laughs> so we came from very different backgrounds. 
And so when we got married, we had to learn how to work together in faith. And I had to learn. I had to unlearn some things and get God's mind on what exactly is his position on wealth, riches, and money. And so last week, the title of this little series that I brought was God, Money, and Me. And there was just some things I had to learn and am still learning. We'll never stop learning until I go to be with the Lord. But I just want to quickly review and then we'll get into the points tonight. And number one, the most important thing that I had to learn that started me out in changing and renewing my mind to what the Word of God said and not what the traditions of men say, and that is that God is not opposed to wealth. It's actually something very important to God. He's a very bling God, in case you didn't know. The streets of heaven are pure gold, are they not? And his mansions and his building materials, what we call is earth and dirt and wood, he actually uses precious gems and stones, and there's, a, there's gates in heaven, the pearls, made up of one single pearl. And, and so God is not opposed to wealth. He's God. He's opposed to wealth having us. As a matter of fact, it says in Deuteronomy, and this is what I use, Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as is this day. And I had to learn that wealth is not something God is opposed to. It's God that gives wealth. God blessed Abraham. God blessed Isaac. God blessed Jacob. God blessed Israel. However... He is opposed to wealth having us. And the reason that he gives his people wealth is so that we can establish his covenant. That is the reason and the purpose. You can do a whole lot more with money than without money. In case you didn't know, we still have to pay the electric bill here at The Rock. It cost millions to purchase, and to build this, to purchase this land and to build this building. And so if you think that God wants you broke, busted, and disgusted, if he wants to keep you poor, then you're looking at the wrong God because that's not how God is. That's not the God of the Old Testament, and that is not the God of the New Testament. However, he does want us to come into divine alignment with him so that wealth, riches, and money do not own us, but we own them. There's a great and a huge difference. The other thing was, is in Psalm, and let me just give you another proof text, Psalm 35, 27. It says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God has pleasure in the prosperity of his people. I had to learn that God's not opposed to wealth and money and riches. He is opposed to the God of mammon, he is opposed to mammon ruling my life and defining my life. He is very opposed to that because he says, you'll have no other gods before you but me. He is God, and there is no other. He made the planets. He made the universe. He can make, he can do whatever he wants except lie, and he does not want his people being controlled by the God of mammon, which Jesus talked about in Luke, the 16th chapter. Now, God wants me to prosper, and God wants you to prosper. That's the will of God. John the third, in 3 John, it says in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So I had to switch my thinking because it was filthy lucre to me. And I was like this to my husband, thinking, oh, the man is so carnal, not realizing that actually God wanted me to grow up past where I had been raised, afraid of wealth, that it would take me away from God. Because listen, if something takes you away from God, where is your commitment? Maybe God wants us to grow up so we can handle the resources of this planet, so we can bring the covenant of God in, fund the gospel of Jesus Christ, let the earth hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we can go home. What a thought. Hello. So not only is God not opposed to wealth, he is the God that gives us wealth. Then I had to find, about, find out about money, and I just had a, a bottle of water. Here it is. I had to find out about money. It says, and I'm just going to read this, Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That translation says money. One translation says mammon. God says, and I just told you that. God says, money, Debbie, is not to be something that you bow your knee to. It should not determine how you live. Money is not to be your master. Money is to be your servant. 
And I had to switch gears on that. Because if money controls you on how you're going to live, what you're going to do, whether you're happy or whether you're frightened, whether you're in faith or out of faith, and money has the power to do that, then we've got to switch gears. And God showed me one, one day years ago when we were having mi dinner with a missionary from another country, and he was talking about money, and he was broke, and he didn't have the faith to believe, and he was just very honest about it. And he wasn't, this is not to cast aspersions against him. But God showed me something in that restaurant, and it was a glass of water. And the waitress was just filling up the water. And he says, are you worried about that glass of water not ever being filled up again? I said, no, Lord. I said, it's replenishable. There's lots of water. He says, you need to look at money that way. Money is a replenishable resource in the hands of God. It is to be our servant. It is not to be our master. So look at your neighbor and say, money is to be my servant not my master. That's a revelation I had to get from heaven. So God, money, and me. Now what are our responsibilities? And tonight that's where we're going because God wants me blessed. He wants to bring the wealth of the kingdom to me and through me to this very, very, very hurting planet. He wants people to know that he's the God of goodness. He doesn't, he's not up there, you know, with a big stick ready to just wipe us all out. The first move we make that's wrong, he's ready to just, there you are, send you to hell. That is not God. God so loved the world that he gave. And we found out that, that man's system is buying and selling, but God's system of economics is giving and receiving. God is the God of generosity. He is a generous God. Satan, who brought this fallen world, and this fallen world is under the power of the prince of the power of the air, Jesus said. He is self-centered. He is independent. He is greedy and he is lustful. But God's kingdom economics works on giving and receiving. The world system of economics works on buying and selling. There's a vast difference. I need to be savvy. I need to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. So get the tape because there's a lot more on there. Then we looked at point number one about what is my responsibility. Point number one was I've got to determine to be a generous giver. Isaiah 32, 8 says, but a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he will stand. God's generous. God is not stingy. God is not broke. God is not uptight about money. He's not uptight about his resources. For God so loved the world that he gave. And I love what Amy Carmichael said, a famous missionary to India in the 1800s. She said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. God is the God of generosity, and he wants his people to have a generous spirit. So I had to learn how to begin to give. The tithe actually disassociated me from the power of mammon and money. God doesn't need my money, but God is allowing me to invest in the kingdom of God so that I can disassociate from that power, and I can begin to release my fears and begin to take on the generosity of the new nature. And that's from the other tape. But let's look at point number two, which my precious husband is going to come and bring us. God's point number two is, ta-da, ta-da. Oh. <laughs> I forgot what it was. Hey, you know what? Uh, I love it when you date yourself like that. You and I have to be cool at our age. What you I in your early 60s and me in my late 60s now, is that you have to realize that there's no such things as get the tape. Did I say get the tape? Yeah, there's no tapes anymore. I know. Download. There's download. Downloads, it. you know, and CDs and all that stuff. Get the tape I'm still is learning like how to plug everybody in, on. that's under 25 in here is going, what's a tape? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so funny. God, money, and me. Now, you've got to translate the title, to that me part is you. So you have to take it personally. So the first part is learning how to be a generous person. You know, I think without a doubt, when I, if I could just share yeah. some things about this, it was kind of fun. When I first met Debbie, she was as tight as she could possibly be. She didn't give anything away. Nothing. And she was, she was you know, she was broke. Bottom line, I mean, she was living on, uh, not on welfare because she had a job, but she would shop in, in uh, thrift stores. Uh, uh, you know, we got married and we moved uh, our house together. It was all antique junk that she bought for a nickel and a quarter. It was treasures. And, uh, it was treasures. It was treasures, yeah, all right. I love those treasures. 
that I could hardly wait to kick them out of my house. And uh, so, you know, it was just the way it was, and she didn't understand that, and giving was just a part of my life. I just like to give. You say, well, you, you, you know, you can't give something if you don't have something. The problem with it is a lot of people say to God these words, you know, if God, if you give me something, I'll give it. It doesn't work that way. It's completely opposite. It's like standing in front of a fireplace and saying, now fireplace, give me heat, and then I'll put the wood in. It doesn't work that. You put the wood in first, and then you light that fireplace, and then eventually the heat comes. And it's the same principle with God. And Deborah had to learn that. Today, I think without a shadow of a doubt that Deborah, my Deborah, is probably the most generous person I know. I mean, if there's ever extra money, ever, ever comes in from some place, she can hardly wait. First thing she tells me, oh, I'm going to put this over there. I'm going to give this to them. I'm going to give this away. I'll give this. And it's like, come on. You know, mama, she used to preach all over the world. I asked her not to do that, stay home with me because I'm lonely. And, um, and so, she, but when she preached all over the world, she'd get honorariums. I mean, one year she went two times around the world preaching in all the countries, got all kinds of honorariums. I thought mama was bringing home the bacon. <laughs> Heck, well, she didn't bring home the bacon. She didn't bring home the smell of the pig. There was nothing, man. She gave it all away. And I, she got home, I said, well, okay, now, you know, you being gone, I, I get some of that money, mama. You know, I'm, I'm, you're working hard, but I'm torturous because you're tortured because you're not here. Where's the money? Oh, I gave it away. They needed it more than us. They needed it more than us. You'll find that when you're a giver, you'll find everybody that needs more than you. You end up giving more, which absolutely builds the fire that gives you the heat. And that's just simply the way it works. And I think she's probably one of the most generous people that I know and uh, even more than I can ever imagine. Second thing that we need to understand about the me part or the part that you have to do is that you need to be an honest and diligent worker. And you can give everything away. And most churches stop right there. You know, just give, 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 give. The, the key to success is give. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's a bunch of baloney. The key to success is not just to give. The key to success is to have the right kind of a heart that will give, wants to give, and that's great, but also to be someone who's going to be a diligent person and someone who's going to work hard at something and someone who's going to be honest at it. Yeah. And I love Proverbs, the 11th chapter, verse number one makes it very clear. Uh, a dishonest scale is an abomination to the Lord. And a lot of times we don't realize that dishonest scale means I'm going to take advantage of you for my own personal gain. And when I approach anything, businessmen, are you hearing me right now? Because you can approach something and you can say to yourself, I'm going to do this for my own personal gain. It'll be your loss, but my gain. And you call that good business. God sees it as an abomination. And you've got to do something. You've got to be fair on every end of this. And you've got to know that there's three parties in every transaction. There's you, the person you're doing business with, and not only if you agree and he agrees, that's fine, but it's also got to fit with the flow of God. God's got to be in it also. Yeah. And God's not in anything that takes advantage of somebody else. Wait a minute, did you just hear what I just said? God's not in anything that takes advantage of someone else. One more time. God's not in anything that takes advantage of someone else. One more time. God's not in anything that takes advantage of someone else. Doesn't mean you don't do good business. Doesn't mean you don't try to buy and sell and make money and do it the right way, but not to the place where you're taking advantage, where you're actually going to hurt somebody else by getting them in a position and hurting them. When you do that, you've just voided out the third party of your transaction, and now you become a dishonest scale. And God doesn't want that. So one of the things we need to be is we need to be incredibly honest about what we do and how we do it in the, in the business world. And sometimes that's very, very difficult to do, especially if you're facing any kind of large finances. You just think, if I just get that, I'll just make it. I'll just get it. I'll just make it. I'll just get it and have it. And then, then I'll worry about the consequences later on. And you'll find that you have a bag with holes in it. And what you get, no matter how big it is, it's gone right away. And so a dishonest scale is something that you and I need to make sure that we're always honest. The second part of what we just said here is there have got to be people that work hard. You can't just flip through life and expect to get something. There's nobody going to, you know, I always say this on Sundays. You heard me say it a million times. There's no Tinkerbell flying over your house 
and, and sprinkling fairy dust all over you. You got to get in the work. What you sow, you reap. If you don't sow anything, you don't reap anything. And I want to tell you something. Some of you, I'm going to really tick off tonight. Can I just tell you something? This is not a Democrat thing. This is not a Republican thing. This is a God thing. When you d rely on the government that keeps you held down to a certain degree, you will never get up and do something. And if you don't do something, you'll never get something. Hard work is really important to make things happen in our lives. You'll find that all the way through scriptures. In Proverbs, the 10th chapter, verse 4, just pop it up on the overhead. Watch these words. Take a look at this. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but a hand of the diligent, the, 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 but the hand of the diligent makes rich. That should have been highlighted. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. you got to get in and make something happen and keep on, keep it on, keep it on. Let me tell you something about rich people. You, maybe you never knew this. Rich people don't get rich because they're nice or good. Rich people get rich because they work hard. Yeah. And that's all they do is that principle works for people that are godly as well as people that are ungodly. And you can be as ungodly as possible, but get in and work hard and make it. And then we say, well, the devil made him rich. No, he just operated in a principle of God. Right. Is anybody listening? That's right. You know, and we get all bummed out. How come they got it? I got God, don't have it. Well, you put in the time they have, you'll have it too, I promise you. And that's what this is all about. This is about, yeah, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. When you have a job, you work eight hours a day. When you're going to build your financial future, you, there's no hours a day. Whatever it takes to get the job done, you don't go at, at nine and come home at five. You go whenever you can go and get up when you can and you keep on going and you're out in the middle of the night if you have to until you make it because whatever you sow, you reap, the Bible says. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, it's a real important principle for us to all see. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, there's really a great verse, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, you don't work, you don't eat. Bottom line, that's the way it is. This is an interesting verse in Genesis. In fact, you might want to turn there, Genesis 26 chapter. Let's take a look at it together. And we're going to just bring this to a close in just a minute. But Genesis 26 chapter, starting in verse number 12, we're talking about... Uh, uh, a, a, a wonderful man of God, and he's in a time of famine. And we find Isaac, the son of Abraham, in a time of famine. Most of you don't know this. Verse number one, 26 chapter, defines what the area is all about. A time of famine means there's no water, there's no growth, there's no food, there's no substance, there's no materials. It's a dry, parched area. People are literally dying of starvation in front of your very eyes. You can plant a seed in the ground and it'll wither and die. It won't grow because you got to have rain. They don't have sprinklers like we had in those days, our days. They, 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 a time of famine was a, the worst conditions you could possibly ever imagine. Nothing existed in a time of famine. Everything died, including people, if they didn't make the proper arrangements. Here's this guy, Isaac. In a time of famine, he's going to now sow. He's going to have to do something. He's going to have to believe God to sow. Sow means put a seed in the ground. Now, you put, a soul, you put a seed in the ground, it's going to die in a, in a time, if you will, uh, in a time of famine. And so here you find the, 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 this, this man Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember, this is the son of Abraham. He's going to put a seed in the ground. And as he put a seed in the ground, uh, it's a time of famine. You can't expect it to grow unless you've got something that makes it grow. And the something that makes it grow, you say, well, that's rain. Oh, no, it's God. Yeah. I want you to hear something. If you're going to do any kind of business transaction, it's not about the rain. It's not about the clouds. It's not about the weather conditions. It's about your relationship with God. And in a time of famine, you sit there and do nothing, or you can hear from God and follow God. If you hear from God and follow God, my goodness, God will bless your hand. Now listen to what it says, verse number 12, 26 chapter of Genesis comes along and says this, then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Wow, that's a pretty amazing time. This guy took a risk. I want you to hear me now. If you're going to make it in finances, you're going to have to take a risk. You're going to have to work hard and make it work. You're going to have to get in there and sow something. You're going to have to take a risk. 
You say, what if I work real hard and don't have anything and never get anything? Then God doesn't work because God made the statement, what you sow, you reap. Are you following me? So he sowed something in the land in that period of time and God was behind him. And the Bible said the rain didn't fall and he didn't get blessed. But he said he reaped a, a, a hundredfold return and the Lord, not the rain, the Lord blessed him. That's your source of your hard work and the success doesn't come from what the politicians tell you, doesn't come from what the Republicans tell you, doesn't come with what the Democrats tell you, doesn't come with what the independents tell you. I don't give a flip what they say. I want to know what God says. You say, I can't make it. I'm in a recession. Wait a minute. I got to tell you something. God is not in a recession, never has been in a recession, and you've got to get over it. And you've got to start seeing yourself that it doesn't matter whether the rain falls or doesn't fall. You've got God who's going to make it work. And doesn't God take nothing to make something out of it? Isn't God that raises the dead? Isn't God that opens the blind eyes? Isn't God that walks on the sea? Isn't God that speaks and the planets exist? Are you telling me it's going to be too difficult for him to bless you? Come on. Just got to change our attitude and work hard. You say, oh, I'm a Christian. I don't have to do nothing. All I have to do is go to church, give the preacher a whole lot of money. That's not how it works. No. Are you following me? Yes. Now, don't let that stop you from giving me a whole lot. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding you. So here he comes along in verse number 13, and it says this about the man Isaac. And he says, and the man began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very Prosperous. He began, you got to begin somewhere. You got to continue at it until you become. That's right. Are you following? And that's the system. That's how it works. Real quick, and I'll quit with this. There's this prophet in the land by the name of Elisha, not Elijah, 2 Kings, fourth chapter. Woman comes up to him and says, You know me, you know my husband. My husband was a man of God. He was a servant of yours, but we are in debt. And the debtors have come after us, and uh, well, he's dead now, and they're coming after my sons to put them in slavery to pay the debt that my husband owes them. Help me. I mean, that's really a tough, tough job for Elijah. I mean, he's not God. How's he going to help her? Yeah. Unless he hears from God. and gets it from God, which you need to hear from and get it from God, you know, he's in trouble. So he looks at this woman and he says, man, widow woman, I know your husband. What can I do for you? And then he stops and he says, what have you got? She says, I haven't got anything. I got a little bit of oil. And he says, okay, here's what you do. Go to all your neighbors and get all the buckets and bottles and cans and anything that will hold oil. Get all that you can. Get as much as you can and come back here. And she does all that. She, he says, okay, tell the boys to pour the oil. The little bit of oil that she had, they started pouring. Bible says, kept pouring. Filled up this bucket and filled up that barrel and filled up that barrel and filled up that tin, filled up that bucket and filled up that until they didn't have any more buckets left. Guys, listen to this. The Bible makes it very clear that it stopped pouring when there were no more buckets if she'd have had more buckets, she'd have had more oil. She had enough to pay off all of her creditors and get out of debt. Why? Number one, she heard from God. Number two, she worked diligently and got it. Number three, she trusted God. And God took what she had and made something out of it. For some of you that are in here, you're going to have to get in a place where God's going to take what you have and start to multiply it. Yeah. And you need to start believing in God again and stop, the stop believing in the recession. Yeah. Stop believing in the negative stuff that comes out of the news media. I don't care what the news says. God says something different. Yeah. The news says you're not going to make it. The news says you're going to lose your house. The news says you're going to lose your job. Guess what? Who cares? God will give you a better job. I'll give you your own business. My goodness. That's right. Deborah? That's right. So Number two, if you'll remember this, is be an honest and diligent worker. Number three, that's you, Mama. Just to make a comment on that, money is a replenishable resource. When Isaac sowed in Gerar, it was in drought, which caused the famine, which means there was no rain. 
It was impossible for him to have a crop. Yet he believed God. He had to get out of fear and get into faith. And what Jim said is so true. I had to learn to get out of fear and to get into faith. When you don't see it, it's so easy to look at your job, to look at your paycheck, to look at your source and think that's it. That's all there's ever going to be. But if you begin to switch gears and realize that your God is the God that made heaven and earth, that you belong to him, that you are a covenant daughter and a covenant son of the living God, with God there is nothing impossible. He's the God that can do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we could hope or ask or think, but he's got to get his people out of fear, into faith, out of slothfulness, into diligence and integrity because like Jim said, God blesses what we put our hand to. And what I've seen in this nation is I have seen an entitlement community grow up in the last 50 years where we think the government owes us something. And what it does is it keeps us contained because you can't make more than what your welfare check is. You can't make more than your disability. You can't make more than your retirement, Social Security. You can't, and so you know what it does? It keeps us small, and it keeps us contained. And all the creativity of heaven, all the resources of the kingdom of God that are in you and God wants to move through you, now they're stopped because you're looking at a measly little stupid paycheck when there is so much more that God has for your life. So much more. So much more. Hey, hey, hey. I got something to add to that. We were, when we pastored when we were kids up in Lake Arrowhead, I had this big truck with a snow plow in front of it because that's the only way I could get people to church. Four o'clock in the morning when it snowed, I plowed the, I plowed the streets and the, and the parking lot so come, somebody would come to church, man. And so uh, we did that. Remember that? And a guy came around the corner one time and hit us. Do you remember that, Debbie? Yeah. And it jerked your neck and your face hit the window. Broke the and and uh, this, the, the uh, now listen to this. The insurance company came to her and we were broke in those days and offered you 3,000 no bucks. No we didn't have any medical insurance. They said, we want you to go get fixed. We'll give you 3,000 sign off. 3,000 in those days was like 3 million today. I mean, it was like all, everything. We both looked at each other. And she made this statement. She says, if I take money from the insurance company, then I can't expect God to heal me. And I said, what? Get the money and believe God. <laughs> she's, more, she, she's more spiritual than me, you know? But that's because I, had, I was learning. But, but I let was me, switching gears. You and did. If I would have taken the money from the insurance company, then I was saying, and this is what the Holy Spirit said to me, I heard the voice of God teach me. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. And he said, you can be healed by a doctor or you can be healed by me. If you're healed by me, you'll be healed forever. And I said, Lord, I want to be healed by you. And so I refused the insurance money. They made me sign a sworn document saying that I had sworn off on it and that I would not go back and sue them. And I fought and fought because my neck was so sore and it hurt so much for about six months. And the devil came and said, oh, you're so stupid. But you know what? Today. There was a point in time when my neck, something Never happened to it, and it was healed, yep. and, it was, and yep. it was a lesson for me. Yep. She's never, she's never had a pain in her neck except me. Well, <laughs> you're not a pain in my neck. But the same but principle. what we're saying is that this is about kingdom. Fear not, little flock. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I would much rather have the kingdom than all the wealth on this on. natural planet because on. my God and my Father Come made it. Come on, girl. Hey, yes. Go to number three or we'll never get through right. this tonight. Number three, choose to develop good money management. Choose to develop. It's a choice. Now, what do I mean by that? Proverbs chapter 27 says, we're going to look at verses 23 and 27. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed, 
and the tender grass shows itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and the nourishment of your maid servants. God says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks. In other words, this thing about money, again, money is either my servant or it's my master. So that means I better control my money. My money better not control me. That begins being a generous giver. It then proceeds to being a diligent and honest worker because this is about kingdom business and God cannot get involved in anything contrary to his word. Number three, God says, I've got to know the state of my flocks. It's not hiding my head in the sand. It's not paying my taxes. Mm. It's actually learning how to make a budget, learning how to know what I own, what I owe, what I earn, and what I spend. It's learning how to manage your money. Because Jesus said in Luke 16, if you can't be faithful in unrighteous mammon, who's going to trust you with what belongs to you, the true riches of the kingdom of God? So this is like we're in school. Now, don't beat yourselves up. Jim and I have made so many mistakes. We have taken risks, and we've lost money. We've lost money in this recession in real estate. But if you look at it and say it's a replenishable resource, then you learn from your mistakes, learn the lesson, forget the details, learn the lesson, but forget the details. All right, you made some mistakes. Okay, you've gotten in credit card debt. Okay, you bought things you shouldn't have bought, impulse buying. You did all of that stuff. All right, well, since when is your life over? What, God's mad at you because you've made wrong choices? Or could it be that he wants you to grow up, learn from your mistakes, he'll pick you up, dust you off, and off you go again in faith to believe your father? Is it so bad? We've made wrong choices. God has recovered us. We've lost money. God has recovered us. We've bought things we probably shouldn't have bought. God recovered us. We had some hard lessons, but we learned them, and we're still learning them. We're never going to stop growing. But you've got to know what the state of your flocks are. You've got to know what you owe, what you earn, what you spend, and what you earn. So the first thing to do, I would say, if you're not doing this, is write down your necessities. Not your wants, but your needs and necessities. God says, be, be content with food and clothing. In other words, what is it you need? You need a roof over your head or you're going to be homeless. So pay your rent. Pay your rent. You're going to need a car to drive. Maybe you need a used car instead of a new car. Believe God. Pay your car payment. Guess what? God says pay our taxes. we got to pay our taxes. That's not our money. It belongs to Caesar. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God. Now, I don't know how the men are in this house, but my man doesn't like to pay taxes. His disciples didn't like to pay taxes. So I'm so glad that God dealt with taxes in the New Testament, and that was 2,000 years ago. Guys, they didn't like it then, and we don't like it now. But guess what? Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. God can give you the money to pay your taxes. Whether they're just and unjust is not the issue. The issue is what God says. The issue is faith. The issue is doing the right thing when everybody else is doing the wrong thing because we're believers and we're to shine brightly in a dark world. So choose to develop good money management. What does that mean? It means learn to budget your needs, your necessities, and your wants. Your wants are at the bottom of the list. Pay your needs and your necessities first. Planned spending brings satisfaction. Impulse buying can destroy us. Hello. Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Has anyone in here ever impulse bought? We all have, probably.
probably, and some of you very disciplined people. Listen, I tell my husband, keep me out of boat shows and car lots. I can't be trusted. <laughs> I don't know what it is about a car lot. I want to buy a car, and I don't even like cars. If I go to a boat show, oh, let's get that, let's get that, let's get that, let's believe God. It's like I turn into another person. I say, honey, I cannot be trusted. Just lead me through the boat show so we enjoy it, but don't listen to anything I say because none of it, none of it is from God. <laughs> know your weaknesses. Impulse buying can absolutely destroy our budgets. How many of us have gotten into credit card debts because we went shopping? Had to have that new outfit. Oh, let me tell you, don't go shopping. We're planting a garden. we got a community garden starting. Come garden with us. Let's plant some seeds and let's watch God make them grow. Switch what you do. So, budget. Learn to budget. Get out of debt. What does that mean? It means take your credit cards and clip them up. There was a time in our lives, our married lives, we had to bake our credit cards. We put them in the oven and baked them. So we couldn't use them. Why? We were young, we were married, we were learning how to get out of debt because we kept getting ourselves into debt. A lot of times when the credit is so easy, it's easy before you know it. There you are in debt and then it's double digit. The borrower is slave to the lender. So start paying off those debts little at a time. Start somewhere and let it gain momentum. Don't beat yourself up. The enemy wants to beat you up. He wants you to have no hope. Don't do that. Remember, it's a replenishable resource. Believe God and do the right thing, and he'll get you out of debt. It may take some time. It's like weight. Have you ever noticed how it's easy to gain weight, but it's very difficult to get it off? It is the same thing with credit card debt. Easy to put it on. Very hard to get it off. So get out of debt. And the last thing about a budget is start learning how to save, even if it's just a little bit. Proverbs 21.20 says, There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. Don't spend everything you have today. God is a God of investment. God is a God that likes us to make money because he wants his kingdom to be established. So even if it's a dollar, if it's 50 cents, if it's nothing more than a coin thing and you're just starting to throw your coins in there, start somewhere with disciplining yourself how to save. I'm good. done. Good, good. Oh, so much. You know, this last part is, is kind of fun. It's this, last one. this is the last one for tonight. Tomorrow, Next Wednesday night, I'm going to take you a little bit deeper in, into things. So we're going to continue this sub subject probably through summer. And um, it's just real important for us to all get a fix on this. The last point for tonight, and this is just for tonight, is learn to be content. And it's really a, a learning curve to be content. Yes, and, it and it's a difficult thing. Uh, one of the things I think is one of the most powerful actions before God is when you come to a place in your walk with God where you just don't give a flip about anything but God and your spouse. You know, you just... You just don't care. Have you ever noticed when you get out of something, sometimes God gets into something? But you had to get out of the way for God to get in? Uh, Deborah and I, the last eight months, have been looking for this little business thing that we wanted to put together. And uh, we would made some offers to some banks on this little business transition that, trans, transaction. And... Um, uh, about uh, two, three weeks ago, we made an offer on this little transaction, and the bank just ignored us. Just, you know, didn't want to sell it to us, didn't want to have anything to do about this little business, and just really ignored us. And the first week, we were really mad. I mean, they're supposed to have gotten back to us with an answer within two days. And now a week's gone by. And uh, that really frustrated us. Well... We finally had two weeks go by without one word, nothing, not a thing, as if we didn't even just, you know, make an offer on this little transaction. And I, 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 the first week I was really frustrated. I mean, like pounding on the table, really angry with them. I'm going to pound them. I'm going to get down there and find out what's going on. I'm going to go down there and find out what's, you know, happening. And then the second week, God just calmed me down. And he said, is that 
that important to you? And I started thinking about it. I said, you know, it's not. I really don't care. I talked to Debbie, and Debbie and I both said, I don't care. She said, I don't care either. And I said, you know, I, I'm so content in where I'm at with God. I got God, Mama, I got you. I, I, we got a great church. I mean, I, I am so content. I don't have to do this. I mean, God doesn't want this, and the door's being closed, then I'm okay with that. And we really came to the place where we could give a flip, could care less. When we finally got out of it, in fact, we were just talking about this morning, we were going like, I wonder what happened to that, you know, and, uh, Never heard, ah, who cares, it's a done deal, it's over with. Bank calls this afternoon right before church. <laughs> we don't want to do this, but we're going to do it. And uh, it seems like we got it, but here's the deal. We had to get out of it first to get into it. I had to be content with God more than I would be by making this business transition and transaction than I had to be wanting God. Sometimes we want things so much that we want those things more and we spend more time thinking about them, yeah. planning for them, desiring them, praying about them than we do about our God. And the real emphasis of what it is, when the bank called and made that statement to me, I said to myself, I don't even know I really want this. <laughs> and I thought, well, before I say anything, I'll just talk to Deb. I said, okay, that's great. We'll talk to you tomorrow, but I got to go. And, 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 and guys, I want you to know something. Sometimes you got to learn how to be content yeah. in every situation. Yeah. And that means contentment comes from God, not by what you have, yeah. not by who you are, yeah. not by your identity. Not by a, uh, whether men like you or don't like you, think big of you. or uh, None of that makes anything. What contentment comes from me, being content, is when you are in God and you find your satisfaction, that he is your exceeding great reward. He is your social security system. I think the bottom line, what we're trying to say tonight about God, money, and me, is that this is supernatural. And I think that we have taken... If you could just imagine mankind has taken just a handful of dirt and hung on to it and said, this is wealth, what the earth can offer me. And it's dirt. And God has this kingdom that is absolutely, exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything you could hope or ask or even think. If you need healing, there's healing. If your marriages need to be restored, there's restoration and forgiveness. There's a fresh start. It's the kingdom of God, the supernatural kingdom. And he's saying to his children, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But you've got to let go of the dirt that's in your hands so I can put in your hands the true wealth yeah. of the supernatural Paul, kingdom of God. Paul writes to the church in Philippi. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 12, let me just pop it up on the overhead so that you can see this. Verse 12, the fourth chapter of Philippians says it like this. I know how to be a base, and I know how to be a bound. In other words, it's not about what I have, whether it's a lot or nothing. I've learned out. Listen to this. He says, everything and in all things I have learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he goes on, the famous next verse comes along, I can do all things through Christ. In other words, the center of his attention is not the stuff he has. When the stuff you have becomes the center of your attention, then the stuff you have is the center of where your heart's at. And God knows that. Be content in who he is. You've got to learn how to do it. It's not an easy process. But you learn how to be content in who he is. Then he starts adding to you. You don't even care, but he starts adding. He starts like w with, uh, with um, uh, Isaac. He starts to bless him in a time of famine. He didn't do anything any different than anybody else, but he, he had God on his side. You have God on your side. And God wants to bless you like he did Solomon. 
He tells Solomon, he says, I'll, I'll bless you. I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you money beyond your wildest imagination. I'll give you whatever it is you need. All I want you to do, Solomon, is to walk like your father David walked. All I want you to do is do what's right in the sight of the Lord. All he had to do was do what's right. He did it for a while and then blew it later on. But guys, this is all about our hearts, learning how to be content. So four things tonight. You know what I'd like to do is that okay. I'd like to just have you stand. If you, if you feel like you just need to stand before the Lord and just get a fresh start, I just want you to stand up. If you need to believe God, come again into faith. Some of you lost homes and your hearts have broken over it. You worked hard for those houses and now they're gone. It's okay. It's a replenishable resource. It's replenishable. God can play catch up with you. And in everything that happens to us, God has lessons and God has goodness, even when we can't see it. So if you would like to just pray this prayer with me, I just want you to just lift your hand towards heaven. And let's pray. Just say, Father, Father here, we are, here we are, the family at the rock, we are asking you, We're asking you to, help us. to help us. We are children. We are children. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. We need you to rearrange us. We need you to rearrange us. Transform our thinking. Transform our thinking. We agree. We agree that money, that money is a replenishable resource. Is a replenishable resource. I renounce. I renounce the power of money. The power of money over my life. Over my life. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me, Father. That I have had my eyes. I have had my eyes on finances. On finances. And not on the kingdom. And not on the kingdom. So I thank you now. I thank you now. That I'm washed. That I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed. I've got a fresh start. I've got a fresh start. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to believe you. From this day forward. From this day forward. I purpose in my heart. I purpose in my heart. To learn. To learn. To become a generous giver. I'm a, I'm a generous gift. Help me, Father. Help me, Father. You know how I am. I purpose in my heart. I purpose in my heart to become a diligent worker. To become a diligent worker. I desire. I desire to learn good money management. To learn good money management. And Father, I just want you to know. Father, I just want you. To know. I am content. I am content. You are. You are my exceeding great reward. My exceeding great reward. And I want to thank you for my King. Thank you for my king. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good, 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 good. I want you to listen closely. What makes you think you're going to heaven? I mean, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Answer that question. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? What a question. And what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'd go. You know, I'm a pretty good person. Nowhere does it say whoever's a positive thinker gets to go to heaven. Nowhere does it say because you're good you get to go to heaven. Some of you might have answered and said, well, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. The guys that stole those airplanes and crashed them in the World Trade Center, can I tell you something? Their last words were, love you all. According to my Bible, wrong God. According to my Bible, they're in hell. So you can say anything you want to say. You're not going to get to heaven because you say you love God. That's the wrong kind of expression of love. That's just plain murder. And it doesn't work that way. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. You know, they took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Put a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. Had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible where it says you can do that and your mom and dad can make that statement and help you, you know, to get to heaven? Because it's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Jesus makes this statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He comes to a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus, in his lifestyle, was probably better than all of us. This guy was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, quoted the scripture, debated the scripture, sang the scripture, 
preach the scripture. How many of you guys have done all that? Fed the poor in his community, wore ecclesiastical robes. He was the head of his church, the synagogue. His name was Nicodemus. I would have thought Jesus would have come to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, you're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. Pat him on the back. But he doesn't. He comes to Nicodemus and he makes a statement. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand what he's talking about, but God explains it to him. Here's what he's saying. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life because it's about your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's after all of your heart and all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ, always has been. Sorry that 250 years in American churches, we've watered that down, but it's all or nothing. I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking, he says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What a crude, rude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? He really just said people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. Some of you have been lukewarm in here with your relationship with God. What's lukewarm? Let's talk about it. Let me define it for you. Lukewarm is this. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Lukewarm. Uh, occasional church attendance, occasional prayer. Lukewarm. God is something, but he's not everything. Lukewarm. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. He's just something in your life, like everything else. It's lukewarm and you're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough, tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, stop playing church and tell you like it is, you're not going to make it. Until you get born again, and that means you're going to have to, from the beginning of the Bible, in the Bible, here's what he's after. Give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. It's your call, your choice. He's not going to make you do it. He's not going to hit you in the head with a two by four. It's not floating around some cosmic cloud. It's going to make you do this. It's your call, your choice to give God what you have. And what he's after is all of your heart. And what he's after from the beginning of the Bible in the Bible is all of your life. So here we are, man. We have laughed. We've had a good time. We've sung great songs. David sang almost a great song. Wasn't that good. <laughs> I'm only kidding, David. It was great. We've had a wonderful time in church. You listened and we had a great time. Why leave this place the same. Today is your day of salvation. You can give God all of your heart in this safe and friendly place. You can give God all of your life. I'm talking to you, yes, every one of you that are in here, and you haven't yet given God. You know God in your head. There's no doubt about it. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. You even went to church with your parents. I know you know who God is. There's no doubt you know who Jesus is. Everybody in America knows who Jesus is. But it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. And here we are. And it's your day of salvation. Now you can look the other way and pretend this isn't real. And hope that the old man shuts up. Or you can get right with God. Tonight, tonight's your night. And someone's calling you to record. Tonight's your night before God. This is a divine appointment you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments, doctors, attorneys, painters, whatever it is, you've had appointments. Tonight is your divine appointment with God. God brought you here tonight to get right with him, and you know it. Tonight is your night. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it my way or your way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, your hands go up. When I see your hand go up, here's what you're saying by the raising of your hand. I'm giving God all my heart, giving God all my life tonight. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand go up. What did he say? He said, if you confess me where? Before men. I'm a man. I'll see it. He said, I'll confess you as mine before my father. But you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. Guess what? He'll deny you when the time comes that you're standing before God because you will stand before God. You'll either be able to stay in heaven or you're going to leave. One way or the other, it's your call. And tonight is your divine appointment. Don't miss this all across this auditorium. Who should raise your hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. 
If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, you need to make sure I'm speaking to you. Tonight is your night. All across this auditorium. So all you have to do is get your hand up in a moment when you hear me pop my hands together and then put it right back down. It's that simple. I'll see it. And you can put it right back down. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But it's better that you be embarrassed in a safe place like this for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you chose not to do that. Come on, no one's that dumb. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Back over here. There's anybody on this section. Okay, anybody here? There's another one back here somewhere. You're pointing back here. Wave it at me. I don't see it. Back here. Eight. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? A family room. None in this family room. In this family room. How many? One. There's eight, nine back over there. Where are you? Number ten. Ten, you know you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? that needs to get their hand up, you need to get your hand up. This is the time. Don't miss this. I'm going to cut this off and you're going to miss it. Anybody else? Where are you, number 10? Where are you, number 10? There's 10 right there. God bless you. I love you. Where's 11? 11, you need to get your hand up. Anybody? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 10 of you, even out of the family rooms, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get out of the family rooms. Ushers, go help them to get out of the family rooms. Help them to carry their stuff. And all across this auditorium, if you're one of those 10 people, I'm expecting you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Now, wait a minute. If you're number 11, you didn't raise your hand, 12, 13, or 14, you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you just come right now. Check with your neighbor. Here's what you say. Come on, neighbor, I'll go with you. If you need to go, I'm here for you. Let's go. And you just check with your neighbor right now, and let's stand and welcome the people as they come. All of you come. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. have come. We're just so grateful for you coming. I want you just to really look to your left, see Pastor Dave waving at you. It's a really good guy. I'm only going to take a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. He's going to do three things. Here's the three things he's going to do. Lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to do that. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, free stuff to take home and read about. Now that you're a Christian, here's what it's going to tell you, what to do next. Really important, okay? Because, you know, most people don't know. I'm a Christian. What does God want from me? Here's what, this will tell you what God wants for you to do, okay? That's number two. Number three, it's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You've heard of personal trainers? These are spiritual personal trainers, friends. These people right behind you, right here. They'll meet you before church service and go over a few scriptures with you and encourage you and pray for you during the week. You know why? So you don't go back doing the same old stuff you used to do, but you go on with God, and that's what a friend does, help you to go with God. So it only takes a few moments. People who came with it, uh, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Dave right over there. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.